So the other one is is um, you know, the sort of efficiency of using multicast here. And there's two aspects to efficiency. One is from the network perspective. People might care about having these multicast DAD probes go out and they go to every switch and every access point and on every Wi-Fi link in your network. Or they might say, oh, that's not a big deal because they don't, they're not very frequent. Right? Um, but the other aspect of the efficiency is the actual host that might want to have get the benefits of duplicate address detection, but actually want to go to sleep for extended periods of time. And the specifications don't actually say how to do this today. Um, the, I'm trying to see, so, um, yeah, so the fundamental assumption is that you always have to be, be present so that if someone sends a DAD probe for your address, you can actually respond. Um, remember what I have on the rest of the slide. So, I mean, people have done various things like there are sleep proxies that handle this and many other things for sleeping nodes. Um, but there's nothing that's sort of standardized in this space. Is there a comment on uh, Next one. Oh. <laughs> um, we, we had a remote audio problem, and I think it's fixed now. That's what they're talking about in the back of the room. Okay. <laughs> um, so the and I, I, the slides have a bit more information in the document because as I wrote the slides, I went back and read some of these documents. Um, but the the RFCs we have specify what you do when you configure the address on the interface. It does says nothing about what you do if the interface goes down and then comes back up. And a number of years back when we did the DNA specification in the DNA working group, it ended up with some um, language relating to that, which says you don't actually need to worry about that when you reattach because the assumption is that uh, you weren't gone for long or whatever. The spec isn't very clear. I don't remember all the discussion that led to this stuff, but because my memory was slightly different. But um, and. This seems to be a bit unfortunate as well, but it's not clear that there's, with the current tools we have, it's not clear that we have a, a good recommendation doing, just because you, your link goes down for a fraction of a second, well, does it make sense to redo that and wait for a second? Uh, probably not, right? If you have, you've been disconnected for a day and you come back to the same interface and your DNA stuff remembers, oh, I know that router, oh, the router's still there. Should I do that or not? Well, probably. Uh, Suresh Krishnan. Uh, Suresh Krishnan. So regarding the simple DNA, I do remember the discussion too. Like, so we finally ended up with this text because at the time our understanding of the probability of duplicates was much more different than what we have today, right? Like, so um, like when we did optimistic data as well, right? Like the uh, TSLLAO and stuff like that. So what we thought was the probability of collision was like, um, how do I say, like much smaller than what we know today. So I think it's probably worth revisiting because at that point we were like talking about like uh, 2 power minus 48 or something like that, right? And now it's probably with VMs and everything, it, it probably needs to get revisited. Okay. So next one. I think that was. So, so that's sort of the, the six set of problems here. And, and this is you know, f the same slides that I put up more or less. Um, in, in Honolulu. So the question is, you know, does the working group want to work on this stuff? And is there is there distinct, important distinction between working on the set of things that are solely about robustness as opposed to uh, also looking at things that enable sleeping hosts to sleep more calmly? Microsoft. Uh, in, in the list of things you did not cover or on, uh, did not cover in the draft, in fact, there is the issue of uh, scalability of multicast. The, the reliance on multicast means that you end up with a very large number of multicast groups if you have a large network. And there have been reports that that was causing issue with maintenance of so many multicast graphs in a network. But that's a more general issue because that you, you, the solicited node and you're doing um, MLD proxies for that. Yes. Even if you didn't, 
even if we completely remove that, we would still have that potential issue, right? Well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a case of basically it's a fundamental problem of having the solicitude not addressed. Yes. And, and that's, that's an issue that applies to that. It applies to neighbor discovery as well. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of amplifies it. But I don't think that, I, I understand the issue and I have opinions of why people run into this issue, but I don't think it's relevant for that at all. We could have a separate discussion saying, should we change neighbor solicitations to be broadcast or sent to all nodes or whatever, right? Or, or, and that or, would- Or some other mechanism, but yes. It's probably was, you're right, it's probably was a separate discussion, but it's, it yeah. should be mentioned as we need to have that in a separate discussion. Okay. Then I have the real problem I have with that is that you are looking for events that if things are right should be extremely rare. Yep. I mean, uh, if you have a 64-bit of identifier, even if you only use 60 of them or even 50 of them, I mean, the chances of having a collision if things are working as designed is extremely rare. And that means that whatever code you have to deal with that on a platform will almost never be exercised. And code that is never exercised typically has bugs. Yes. And so th that's, that's one of the, the fundamental issue I have with that here. I mean, how do we deal with the fact that code is rarely used? How, what is the process by which we verify it? Yeah, you can do testing by forcing collision, but, but the problem is that if you do that in a test lab, you're testing in a test condition that you have manufactured yourself, which is not quite the same as what happens in real life. And, and, I, and I think that, that it's a good comment, right? It's something you definitely need to think about. The, when we designed that, the, the probability of collisions was even lower, and the, the only case we knew about was duplicate MAC addresses that some manufacturers had managed to create right, for their devices. And that was why we sort of ended up with this rather poor DAD, but more than zero, as I remember. Because in the case when you do have a duplicate, it's a pain to actually troubleshoot and figure out what's going on. So that's why we said, okay, send one packet, it will detect this stuff with some probability, maybe not all the time, but it will give you some hints as you're trying to figure out what, what is so broken, why can't I talk to some host and not others, right? Like, so Brian? Yeah, <clears throat> um, Brian Carpenter. Sorry, a little voice malfunction there. Um, one observation is that dad is essentially performing neighbor discovery on yourself because if neighbor discovery on yourself succeeds, there's, there's a problem, right? So I'm not sure that the problem set is actually <clears throat> disjoint from the problem set for neighbor discovery because I can't see any reason why most of these things wouldn't also be problems for neighbor discovery on these networks with lousy multicast. Um, <clears throat> so well, I think actually the problem needs to be solved because it will happen. But, but neighbor discovery retransmits because... Well, exactly. And, and, and it can retransmit because there's a positive acknowledgement associated with, I sure. found you, right? Sure. Here sure. you expect the result to be to not find yourself. Sure. And hence you cannot, re you do not know when to stop your retransmission. I, I agree. But because of the sleeping host problem, you don't know when to stop neighbor discovery either. Well, you do because the, you're assuming that the higher level protocols deal with that issue. Mm -hmm. if, 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 t if, if I go to sleep with an active TCP connection, I shouldn't be surprised if the TCP connection I have times up. I, I'm not sure that's the complete analysis. Anyway, what I really wanted to say is, I take Christian's point that this will happen, right? Murphy's law proves that it will happen. You know, my example from the Geneva bus system proves that it will happen, right? So you can't duck the problem just because it's difficult. What? Well, yeah, but I, I hear both you and, and, and Christian saying, we shouldn't worry about that, we should redo neighbor discovery. Is that a clear, is that what I'm hearing? Because, because that's opening up Pandora's box. And Excuse me, that's not what I was saying. What I was saying is that uh, we have in the design to consider the fact that these things are very difficult to test and verify. Sure. Uh, to Brian's point, I mean, that, as it's designed now, is a one-off. 
is based on the belief that you can do a test at time t and the result at time t will carry over for whatever duration you keep the address. Uh, that, that in itself, as you point out, is not very robust. Yep. So clearly, it will be better to have a continuous mechanism. We could certainly brainstorm continuous mechanism that don't have this property that I try once. And there are mechanisms like, for example, if someone else detects that there are two, two guys with the same address and things like that, and there are all kinds of stuff that could be done that are not done today. Mm -hmm. that will provide more, much more reliability that is one-off, which normally is useless and in many cases doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have another slide because I wrote another draft on sort of here's some, some, some ideas of how the potential solutions, but let's finish the mic line. Lorenzo uh, Colidi, let's see. So as for the efficiency issue, I, I don't think we should work on that as a priority because we expect this stuff to be rare. And so if you are a host that is capable of coming out of sleep when you receive a packet, um, then you know you probably have a way to do this. And if we build our links with decent number of hosts on them, like not 100,000 hosts, collisions will be rare enough that we don't really need to worry about the power impact of this. Uh, so, so I guess one thing I didn't cover was you said hosts that wake up when they receive a packet, right? And that's one class of sleeping hosts that we actually mentioned. We actually categorize these things in Honolulu. If, if you There's another class of hosts that sleep on a schedule. So then they will then wake you don't up. have an address. If you can't receive a packet, then there's no point in you having an address. Well, you might want to ensure that each time when you come back, you don't have to always allocate a new one because that's additional overhead as opposed to, and say, I got this address, can I use it for a week? Well, we have a protocol that does that. It's called DHCP, right? Where, where it actually provides that guarantees. When you do Slack, you do not have that because of the way we do that, right? And I don't think we should say, well, if you want that good, you use DHCPv6 or use IPv4. I mean, you can, use, you can do dad when you wake up. It depends, I suppose it depends on the cost, right? But, but it also depends on do you get first dibs on the address, right? I allocated this no, address. No, you don't. Like, if you're not there, you lose the claim to it. Otherwise, because there's no way to implement that correctly unless the network does registration for you. DHCP does it. V4 right. solves it. No, 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 that's right. So if you, if you do it in the network with something that's always on, you can do it. I yes. don't think you can do it if you're asleep. And, and, and the sleep proxies do this as well for yes. you, right? Yes, if you have something that's always awake. But my that's point is I, I don't think you can solve that without having an anchor. Correct. Right? Yes. So then. But, but, but you made the argument that we shouldn't solve that. So I'm trying to understand. You, you, is, is the argument that that's not an important thing to solve? Yes, that was what I wanted. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, it's, I don't think that's a priority to solve. And for, and for multicast links, so for multicast efficiency, um, and, you know, your observation is this is just neighbor discovery. Mm -hmm. And if our links can't do neighbor discovery, then the whole protocol falls over really, right? So um, I, don't yeah. think, I don't think that's, that's a strong argument that you know, we should the, redesign the system. The, 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 I agree, the network part of, of multicast is not, the efficiency of multicast for the network is not the important thing there, right? It's really the, should we think about sleeping hosts or not? That's the question. And for robustness, I, I think you made an observation uh, while answering the previous question. It was, we kind of designed this, we knew it was not reliable, we kind of designed this as a best effort to tell you what, what went wrong when something screwed up. Um, I don't know that that trade-off is actually any more right or wrong than it was at the time. Because it, you know, as you're correct, right, it's not reliable. It's sort of this best effort thing. I, I, don't, I don't know why it needs to be made reliable if the probability of collision is so low. I don't, need to, I don't know that we need to remove it. I, I, don't, I don't know that we need to do anything, really. <laughs> Okay, so we're okay. over time, so we can do the two people at the mic and then move on. Pascal Tuber, <coughs> first observation about Christian's point is that 
Uh, because we just talked about the registration and the anchor is that if you register whether you get a good or bad status, you exercise this most of the code most of the time. So that's just a side discussion. I was extending also the, the, the question about uh, IEEE. There, there was this, but Eric mentioned this, this point that it's not our fault, it's IEEE's fault, they, they, they better make their links better or whatever. And at some point, I'm not clear what the expectations for having ND work correctly, what they are today. I mean, do, can we, I hear some people say, oh, let's make a slash 64 per device so we don't have any problem. Or um, we can't make this network so big that, 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 because of the multicast, et cetera. So do, do we have a clear image of what works and what's broken and how far it goes? And so that's just a question in the air. And the second question in the air is like, I'm hearing more and more that now we get attacks on MLD. So we've got reliance on IEEE, and we say it's therefore they don't do multicast or what, but how can we force them to do anything? And second is reliance on MLD. We kind of know it's broken for what we use, but we still mandate it. What's the point? Should we get rid of MLD? Or not use it for the purpose of listed node. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave them on the off, off, off topic for the time being. So we can talk about that some other time. Hey guys, John Brzezowski. So I, uh, you know, Eric, we started conversations a while ago. I've been very delinquent with the with the work that you've been trying to organize. But but I don't know if I understood Lorenzo's point uh, specifically. But I, I think we do need to solve this. I mean, we have. We do have this notion of links in, in cable networks, for example, where there are, are very large numbers of nodes and they, they get they get larger, right? So, um, you know, we've over the years had to put, you know, we basically had to put a lot of workarounds, you know, kind of creative workarounds in place to kind of make sure that you know nothing gets blown up. So, I mean, you know, I've been I've been very interested in, and supportive of this, you know, lacking in the contrib you know contributor space, admittedly, mm -hmm. um, but but I think there's something to be to be done here, right? Uh, and, and I think that was ultimately the, what your question was, right? You know, do we? Yeah, uh, th that was, <coughs> the, the question was, you know, for the working group, you know, what do we need to do here, right? So I think that, there, well, I think I've heard Lorenzo say that we don't need to do anything. What I've seen elsewhere on the list, people seem to think we should do something. It's not clear what, what yet, but, and, and I don't know. The other thing I was trying to tease apart was sort of, do we care, to what extent do we care about sleeping hosts and I guess what flavor of sleeping hosts and is that part of the thing we're trying to do if we improve things here, right? And mm -hmm. that part is less clear to me right now, but for food for thought, yep. I, had, I had this other um, slide that basically said there's a separate draft, right? That I just pulled together just before the deadline that says, here's some ideas of robustness um, basically off of the ACD pattern and so, and then it was some email exchange, and I realized that yeah, Solaris had actually implemented things slightly differently, but the similar implementations might exist elsewhere as well, where people have looked at ACD or V4 and merged that with their V6 code, which is what was done in Solaris. And that might be useful to capture a bit more accurately. And then the other one is this notion that yeah, I have some, when I go to sleep, I have some proxy that will take care of that for me, right? Those are two different classes of solutions that solve different subsets of these problems. And I can go update this document, but I still want to go back to, you know, does the working group feel like uh, we should work on and on what part of this stuff? Yeah, we really need to move on. Okay. okay. So, so it's still you. Think but, I think, yeah. but I think we have to continue this on the mailing list, like, right, and see if we. Uh, and tease out any. Yeah. Yeah, so, so please read the that issues draft then. If you have comments on potential solutions, I mean, I don't, I'm not very attached to any particular solution, but just sort of throwing ideas out there and see what sticks, right? That's a useful thing to do as well on the mailing list or in the hallway. So, uh, different topic, router solicitation refresh. Um, so, um, I'll go through these ones quickly, but. Um, See, um, so, so the observation was that uh, the, there are cases when the periodic RAs are inefficient. And some of that might have to do with how people set the timers and should we just increase the maximum timer by which they can be sent. Um, 
but people have also pointed out that, well, there's some fundamental scaling issues and Wi-Fi might not be the worst one here. There is a draft uh, that points out how things might work in 3G networks that has a coupling where the phone goes to sleep and hence needs to be paged and every multicast RA needs to be sent on the paging channel to a large number of base station or base station controllers, whatever they are, and hence you're getting not quite N squared behavior, but heading in that direction. Um, so that's my uh, inaccurate summary of that draft. Um, so, um, so, so people can, can increase the frequency you send it to, and we can definitely remove the, the current limit that's their uh, sort of artificial limit in the spec. But there's still a question about if you do that, what's the actual behavior that you get? The conversation with Lorenz on the list pointed out that, well, yes, but how do you actually know that you, you if you send them in frequently enough, you might miss an update. And if these RAs are only multicast, how do you know that you got all the prefixes? Well, maybe you missed one packet in the last day because I only sent one today or whatever, and you didn't get that update. So there might be some things there in terms of reattaching that you need to look at. Next. Um, so listening very carefully what Rand Atkinson said, yeah, there definitely are links where you don't want to change the current behavior. It's fine to send multicast RAs relatively frequently because it's the most efficient way of distributing information on like a satellite link or something like that. But giving the operator the opportunity to choose saying, I have this type of link that has these characteristics. Can I do something that's different that works better on that link? And the other thing is that as you do this stuff, yeah, I think that it's fairly natural that if you implement something new in this space, you would also implement resilient RS. So couple those things together and think about them together. Next. So the, the, the actual meat in this spec is two pieces. One is a flag in the router solicitation that basically says this host is capable of doing unicast RS refresh. Uh, and the other thing is that there's a, an additional option in the RA that says if you're capable of doing unicast RS refresh, here's the frequency by which you do that. Um, and you can even set it to infinite, meaning never talk to me again. I don't know why I put that in. No, but, uh, next. So there's some behavioral changes here. So currently 4861 says you may multicast a response to an RS. And here we're changing that saying, no, you should actually unicast, an immediate unicast response to a, a unicast RS. Um, you have to deal with RSs that have an unspecified source address. That's something that 4X61 allows. So you can actually send an RS in the process of doing that. But here it says, well, you need to have some special rules because you can actually do a regular unicast response to that. Um, when you go and want to distribute changes, um, they, you, you can actually say, well, I can multicast these things, right? And I can multicast three of them. But an observation, which I thought was captured in the RFCs, but doesn't seem to be very well, is, well, you not, not actually guarantee that people will receive these things, right? If you, there, there's some probability that even after three RSs that set some prefix lifetime to zero, some host didn't actually receive it because you have a non-zero drop probability. So, so the, the worst case of all these things is you can't get rid of information until they naturally expire today. If I set something with a lifetime of seven days, I could have a host that wakes up after seven, that, or has, not, let's not say wake up, that happens to have a high packet loss for six days. And then it receives, then it comes and it says, I'm going to do this stuff with this prefix. Well, the prefix has been timed out. And by the way, if you only do it three times during, you know, 30 seconds, well, it doesn't have to be gone for that long. And then it can sit there and six days later, it will send a packet using that address, right? Because from its perspective, the prefix hasn't timed out yet. So we're not very good at, at, at ensuring that updates are, are taken into account. And DNA, the, the simple DNA spec, doesn't require any revalidation either, right? Um, 
So uh, it's hard to remove stuff. You can try, try to get stuff out more, more quickly. Every yep. time you mention DNA, then Suresh comes to the mic. <laughs> yes, I noticed the pattern, yes. No, uh, actually, it's not like... Who are you? Please Suresh announce Kushman, your name. Again. Uh, so it's not that it requires or doesn't require, but uh, as an efficiency uh, hack, right, we started doing both NS probes and RS probes at the same time. So since we start doing that, if the RA comes in, it will actually uh, revalidate the stuff. So it doesn't require it, but as a side effect of... Oh. The, the efficiency probe, like, it, it is going to get an RA. I thought the RS probe was optional, but you could do the NS first, and if you get a response, you're fine. You could, but, like, usually, if you do okay. it, you do it in parallel, right? Yeah. Okay. Next. Um, so, so, the way DNA, so the DNA is the only spec we have that, that tries to capture what you do when you, your link goes up and down. In one case, when it does that, it's if you go to sleep. But that's only, you know, if your link goes down because you walk out of range, it's the same thing. So the title on the slide might be misleading. But, um, but so DNA says when you wake up, you, you, you send an NS to the router and you assume that things haven't changed if you get a response. But you can actually couple this stuff with RS refresh and make something that can be a lot more efficient. So, so you can actually use RSs instead of NSs, and you can actually then get any new prefixes or other things that have changed back uh, and actually be able to be more certain that you actually have gotten the most recent information, right, if you use RS for this instead. So I think that's what that slide said, yes. Um, so um, there were, Lorenzo brought up some good points on the list about well, what happens if you are a legacy 4861 host and your RS is lost, what actually happens? Well, this notion of having a bit that says whether or not you can do unicast or RS refresh doesn't help because the router would never see that. However, if you don't get much service, if you don't implement resilient RS, and you have packet loss that might affect your RS, your service you get from the network is rather poor. Because today you might have to wait for whatever it is, 18 minutes, right, to get the next periodic RA. If we increase that timer to be 18 hours or whatever, um, you might have to wait for a long time. People are not going to be that patient. They're going to you know, go somewhere else, right? So I think the only way to cope with this case is when your RS isn't delivered reliably is resilient RS, full stop. And, and if, that's why assuming that and saying we're building upon that assumption, if you don't have it, well, then go add it to your implementation because, because if you uh, on any network that has packet loss, you will have issues. Um, some questions is why can I use it to completely disable periodic multicast RAs? And the summary is, well, that's probably not worthwhile, right? If you're sending out one multicast packet every few hours, well, if your network melts from that, I think you have other problems. Um, so uh, you can potentially do this stuff in, in when, you, when you have controlled deployment, meaning that you know all of your hosts, and you know that my hosts have to be certified to this particular whatever standard, and hence I know that they all support unicast RS refresh and resilient RS, and hence I never have to send any, any multicast RAs. So it doesn't really matter whether you say it's 30 minutes, five hours, whatever, right? Next. Um, there, there's, I think, two open issues in the draft. One is this timer I randomly picked to be 16 bits in seconds. We can have it be longer. Um, and the other one is this, oh, three issues, sorry. And the other one is the document doesn't currently say this, but we could say if you're doing this and if your interface goes down, when you come back up, you should send a RS refresh when the interface comes back out. And that ensures that you're getting any updated RA information that you might have lost while your interface was not functioning. And I think that that would make things more robust. And one could debate whether, oh, if the interface went down for a millisecond, do I need to do this stuff? 
well, what's the timer at which, you know, for how long do you have to be gone to, to trigger this stuff? There's another open issue, which is we could optimize this thing when you come back or when the interface comes back where <coughs> uh, you can include some epoch number so that you find out about something saying, the RA says, here's the epoch number for this configuration. And you send that in your, your RS refresh and say, I have this epoch number. And if you get back the same, and if the router says, well, that's the current one, I don't need to tell you anything because you already know everything. Right? Then you can make these packets be smaller, but that's just making them be smaller. So it's just an optimization. So I don't know if that's worthwhile. So that's the content of the draft. Uh, with some, I think next slide says, what are the steps? Where do the steps lead? So, questions, comments? Lorenzo Caliti, I feel that the, you know, instead of the audience throwing fruit at the speaker, the speaker should have ammunition of his own to be able to throw back at the audience. So if you have ammunition, please throw stuff at me. <laughs> um, so, uh, colleague of ours has an awesome t-shirt, which I wish he had printed more copies of. And it says, ITF asking how before should since 1991. So, I think this applies here. I think you're proposing tinkering with ND and RA, and I think, yeah, we can. I'm just not sure that it's worth it, because if you look at the sort of, we, we had this conversation on the mailing list. It, it, you know, if you look at what's actually needed, sort of in a, in a mainstream host environment, I think none of this is actually necessary. Even the page and channel thing for a mobile network, my phone sends packets all the time. Like one every 30 minutes, that's, you know, luxury, right? It's doing TCP all the time. It's got email syncing. It's got chat messages. It's, if, you're, if you're talking about some sort of special case environment, that's one thing. But, you know, if you, all you need to do is just piggyback on those existing packets and send your RAs opportunistically and you're done, right? Because the, when, when the radio is hot, sending an extra, whatever it is, 60 byte packet is essentially free, right? So I don't know that that's really something that we need to solve. And the other options there, there doesn't seem to be sort of very strong reasons to tinker with what I see as core part of the protocol. I think that if we do end up going this route, we will find that it's going to be hard to actually reconcile all the goals. For example, one thing that you say is, OK, well, can I get rid of multicast array altogether? That you, you have a slide on that. Um, but if you can't, what's the point of any of this, right? Because it's not like multicast RA is um, particularly expensive if you send one every five hours. Right, so That's what the slide said, yes. So what's your point? No, so my point is like, why do anything <laughs> again? Well, no, just because that, that doesn't logically follow, but anyhow. N n what I'm saying is um, if we can't turn off periodic multicast RA, you're saying probably it's not worth it. That, that's no, I'm saying that it's, not, it's probably not worth it because your network, as you say, need to be able to deal with some multicast anyhow. However, the behavior in terms of getting the robustness so that we can robustly, as you correctly pointed out, distribute changed information in RAs, which today we actually can't, right? Today, we happen to depend upon the fact that the, the router, when it has some changes, can send three uh, multicast RAs in 48 seconds or whatever it is, right? And if those are not delivered, you lose. That's what the spec says. And you say we don't need to fix that. No, no, no. Well, we don't need to improve that because that's tinkering with this protocol no. that we shouldn't actually try to improve. That's what you're saying. I, see I hear your message. I don't agree. But. No, I see that as, I, 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 I do agree on that. Um, why unicast? Why just not send multicast RS? Well, it's not, it's not the multicast per se. It's the fact that you need to have acknowledged things. I think we learned this stuff a long time ago that TCP works because it has acknowledgments. And the RS plus RA is actually serving that purpose because you send an RS, if you don't get an RA back, you retransmit, right? That's the behavior that you get. And this thing of I send the multicast out and yeah, people actually receive it because you always receive all, all multicast, right? Made sense when multicast was as reliable as unicast. 
but it isn't anymore for a number of reasons. The world has actually changed. And I acknowledge that this was actually a mistake when we did it. But you don't seem to be latched on to 1994. No, no, I think you didn't make a mistake when you designed it. You're trying to fix it because you designed it, but you didn't make a mistake. My point, so for take 802.11, take 802 okay? That's like the bogeyman for unreliable multicast. It's not unreliable. Uplink multicast is actually acknowledged. It's but it has nothing to do with the link layer technology. It has to do with the fact that the, the inner, you can walk out of range. You might be unplugged from the wire for a while, right? There are all these things, and the protocol is not actually robust against any of that. And we fixed one with resilient RFs, but that's one of them, right? Can you finish your comment, yeah, please? So I, think, so I think in order, what we, what we should do is I do agree that hosts should refresh their information. I, do th I think that it should be multicast, not unicast, because the new information could be a new route has joined. I think that we are not going to get as much bang for the buck as from doing this as we as it might seem at first glance. I think those those are the two points. I think we should do multicast refresh. I think we should first of all we should definitely say responses should be unicast, definitely. So, um, so if you do multicast response, you you cannot associate the response with a request, hence you cannot use it for a sort of a DNA perspective, whereas you can say, I'm really connected to where I was before, because you don't have the, that bi-directional acknowledgement. So, so you have to then also keep that NSNA exchange there to make sure that it's, things are still working the way they're supposed to. So that's why I think it makes sense collapsing that thing together with DNA and say, use the RSRA unicast. OK. In any case, yeah, let's. Lawrence, you can you move reply, to back to the then, line? So three things Please. I think we should we, fix we need, tactically. We're, we're over time. We need to finish. No more people at the mic, please. Fred Temple and Bowen, I think I have an easy one. Are you considering having to up, update uh, the IPv6 over foo documents that this would be affecting? Uh, no. Why would I need to do that? Uh, because I think different link, link layers have different attributes and different characteristics. Some might still benefit from multicast RA. Oh, sure, but that's why the, this is a configuration knob, right? You, and the spec says the default should be current 4861 behavior. So you need to explicitly enable it when you have links that, or in deployments where you can benefit from this. Okay, I, I'm just concerned about uh, existing IPv6 over foo documents that might not be updated by this. It should be updated by this. I don't think they need to, but it doesn't change anything in those documents, right? It, it, it says here's an option that you can use and you can configure them. You can configure them on the Wi-Fi network in this room if you want or anywhere else, but anyway, it's just configurable. Okay, if I can come up with some examples, I'll send you an email. Okay. Uh, Suresh Krishnan, just keep my comment short. Like responding to Lorenzo, I agree with him that it's not a problem for mobile phones, but the problem we're actually talking about in the mobile networks is for uh, sensors and M2M kind of applications where the number of nodes is much larger than like number of mobile phones connected because the, the bandwidth needs are very low. So we did actually the draft that uh, Eric put up there. Uh, we did the numbers for 10 million nodes connected in a city area pretty much, right? Like so about 1,000 base stations. For 10 million nodes, we had 6.3 million packets per second of just paging and uh, RA messages, just out of RAs. So that's a real problem that we need to fix. On a mobile phone, like always connected, we don't see the problem very much, okay? But something sleeps and comes back up, we do see major issues in the numbers. Uh, Fernando Gond, uh, I'm glad that you wrote this setting. I would like to see it adopted as, uh, by the working group. And uh, I volunteer if you want uh, to review the document, if that's okay. helpful. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Eric. I, I think we'll um, continue this on the mailing list. And the next speaker is uh, Beckett, please. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, so we're having two, uh, two presentations on, uh, on this problem, uh, one by Pierre and one by Beckett, and we thought we can do clarifying questions um, now in Beckett's presentation, where we'll do discussion and larger issues at the end of these two presentations. So if you can limit it to 10 minutes each, and then we'll do discussion afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm not Eric Nordman, so I'm not going to stay here for hours. Now, of course, I know 
No offense to Eric, by the way, he's a good friend of mine. Thank you. Can you stand a little bit further away from the microphone, please? Uh, yeah, I, I'm in trouble. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Now, okay. Now, um, source of this, or other or source of this dependent routing um, issue, we started to discuss, I think, last year, beginning of the last year or something, and then um, a lot of um, heated debates on the mailing list. And first we started with a solution draft. Then um, uh, I came up with a, a, an overview kind of um, draft uh, that explains things other than just uh, you know tries to throw away a solution. So this overview draft um, um, has been discussed and um, o over the time has been um, um, revised um, to include all the comments that have been made. And uh, so we, uh, main points from discussions have been included in the overview draft. And so um, uh, we believe that the overview draft is ready for working group adoption. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, one issue that, um, that still seems to stick is the next stop. Uh, because Sadr, we always have been talking about Sadr, and then so it's our source of this or, or source prefix. Uh, configuration on the hosts, but uh, there was also NextHop, which uh, has somehow been overlooked. Then um, we, uh, I think Oli has uh, reminded us about that. Uh, why is this um, thing coming out there? Um, NextHop issue, so I'm asked to, to clarify, or at least to try to clarify why we need NextHop, um, we need to configure the NextHop uh, uh, at the host. So, um, the scenario is the VPN access. So next, I think next slide is a, a nice picture. Um, so the, current, currently the VPN routers have this uh, um, installing a lot of host routes at the, at the hosts. So instead of that, um, if the VPN router can um, configure the host with the next up, uh, addresses of the, of the routers on different interfaces, then um, um, this will solve the, the issue of uh, installing um, host routes uh, and so many of those, 40, 50 host routes on the host. So, so here the, the scenario is the, the VPN router sends an array with next up uh, addresses of, um, um, for example, if on the wireline interface, BNG, and then um, while Wi-Fi interface, the gateway. Actually, Wi-Fi used to go over BNG, but now I think uh, because of this access router, access controller, um, so many um, Wi-Fi access points, uh, the operators are, are separating the architecture, so uh, separating the control from the BNG. So, um, so they have another gate. So th this is, by the way, from BBF uh, World Bank Forum, which is kind of in charge of this home network architectures and so on. So um, Wi-Fi uh, over gateway, and then um, the cellular over P gateway. So if the um, VPN router can, uh, can configure the host with the next up uh, addresses of these uh, routers, BNG gateway or P gateway uh, uh, for all the, all the interfaces of the host, either with a single array or, um, or several arrays over different interfaces, then um, uh, we, won't have, we, we are not going to need um, host routes, uh, install so many host routes on the host. That's um, really the main idea. And next uh, slide. So um, now, uh, <coughs> the, if we get into the solutions, we have a, now we have a couple of solutions. Um, there was this next stop array uh, solution draft, and then um, separated the source uh, solder solution into a separate draft, and we noticed that um, uh, Fistar also came up with a um, similar solution, but uh, di using different type of options. Now, so the, these questions I, I'm asking um, in, in the name of uh, draft Fistar, because he, he is saying that we should not use any single options. We should not define any single options like source prefix, but rather only combined prefixes. 
So I'm asking, is it okay to define single options or only combined option should be defined? Now, um, regarding source prefix uh, combined with the uh, root prefix option, now we have also RFC 4191, which defines PIO, prefix uh, information option. Now, um, again, in the name of uh, draft Fister, Fister is asking, maybe he's gonna, he has next presentation, maybe he's gonna ask the same question. Um, should the, uh, the router have the PIO option with an ignore flag if we use uh, source prefix combined with the uh, root prefix option or if you have a root prefix option com combined with other like next stop option and so on then uh, should we have um, a PIO option added um, and ask the, the host to ignore PIO um, so these are um, but, but my observation is here again um, so the claim uh, with the drought feaster was oh we need only one option but now adding the second option, so that means we, we need at least two options. So we are getting into many options anyway, so. Okay, next, I think this is the last one. Um, now, again, um, next option, since the next stop was not defined, was not discussed, uh, well, uh, we, d we discussed a lot the other uh, source of this uh, dependent routing and so source prefix option with, uh, is almost, I think, uh, almost everybody agrees. Uh, but next stop option, um, with this um, uh, scenario, does it make sense? Uh, should we define next stop option? And um, uh, next stop address, and next stop address and root prefix, and, and if we can define, combine with other things, and then this, um, the router can, together with, this, uh, with the um, VPN router, for example, together with the, um, combine with source prefix and root prefix, and um, configure the host with all the information we need. So, um, oh, another important question, which we did not discuss much, is the DSTP options. Now, um, should we define the corresponding options in DSTP also? Uh, I have currently one draft uh, with, with the next op option defined in DHCP. Um, we did not discuss this much. I asked the DHCP group, uh, they said you should, define, you should discuss this in six months. And um, so I'm asking this question, should we define corresponding DHCP options, Southern option and then next up option in, um, uh, for Southern and next up in DHCP as well? That's it. Okay, uh, any clarification questions? Keep them brief, please, and we'll do the main discussion after, after Pierre's presentation. Oh. Uh, Alex Petrescu. Uh, the VPN question. Uh, we're, we we're not answering the questions here. We, we're just asking for clarifications on the presentation and, and the okay. content. Do I understand well that you are y using a uh, VPN with uh, IPv6? Yes, uh, IPv6. Is this a... Uh, Enterprise grade VPN, or is it some uh, uh, something that will come in the future from BBF, maybe? Oh, BBF uh, part, uh, uh, I don't know, but uh, the first, yes, uh, enterprise type of VPN, but BBF uh, standardization is, uh, is another question that I don't know. Okay. Brian Haberman with, with my shepherding AD hat squarely on my head. Um, so we have a liaison statement from the BBF that says we're looking into this. And that's it. They are not looking for us to define solutions. So are you saying that this that the BBF work is your justification for doing this? No, no, as I told um, Alex, uh, I, I, frankly, I stopped BBF in, uh, since quite some time, so I don't know what's going on in BBF. So I'm not talking about VVF here, yeah. With my own hat. Uh, yeah, BBF, if they want something, they send in. Alas, uh, yeah. Uh, Stephen Bart. I, um, I don't intend myself to pursue this in BBF also. So go ahead. D just a quick clarification question. You mentioned uh, PIO and RFC 4191, but 
Um, my understanding it's RIOs in there, right? I was a bit confused about seeing PIOs being mentioned with ignore flag. So, so PIO is, in, in, from my understanding, it's prefix information option, which is yeah. like for configuring addresses, but don't you actually mean route information options, which are like specified in 4191 because PIOs aren't specified in 4191? Yes, so what is the point? Sorry. Do we the, the point is you said PIO, you have it but or I not? think it should be RIO or not. I, I'm a bit confused about that. So uh, this is in the uh, draft Fister, so he is defining PIO with the um, ignore flag. So should we have it or not? Uh, I'm asking in his name, so. No, no, no. Uh, to my understanding, it's route information option, not prefix information option, which is a different thing. You yeah. know, the one is for configuring addresses and the one is for configuring routes. So it's just, I, I just want to But here we are combining the two. Wrong. No, no, I just it. want to mention that it's probably wrong on there and I was a bit confused about that. So I'm not sure what the intention was then. So sorry, but. Yeah, maybe Pierre can clarify. <laughs> well, it's a clarification question. Can you go back to the slide? Uh, sorry, yeah. diagram. How does the VPN router know what happens inside any of those other networks? Like, you know, routers could come. We assume that they know, yeah. So wait, so you're v saying. VPN router has the knowledge of uh, the overall network. Uh, that's what we assume. Yeah, that can configure. Sorry, so to clarify, the assumption is that VPN router knows what's going on in all those other networks. Uh, knows the, knows the, um, uh, the, the, the router next up other seas. Yeah. So like, so, so. And then also possibly other, yeah. So how would it know Source if, like, people. say, I change my default router on Wi-Fi or add a new one? It has to change, yeah. Maybe you're, you're no longer in, uh, in VPN, so then you get the array directly. So to phrase the question slightly differently. So it's a mobility issue, yeah. Are, are you proposing that you do third-party next stop not only to the same interface or on the same interface, but also to different interfaces on the host? Is that correct? It can, yeah, yes. It could be same same interface. Then in that case, it has to repeat for other interfaces as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One uh, last clarification, and then it's Pierre. Well, uh, Alex Petrescu, this is not really a clarification. This is a suggestion, if I yeah. can have. Um, if you say that this scenario is mainly for VPN, VPN also has its means to set up all these addresses and prefixes in Ike uh, setup. They have these, uh, these kind of parameters that, so we could enhance VPN instead of enhancing router advertisement. I will write email to you about this. And the second, okay. the second uh, suggestion is that a, a router advertisement over a tunnel will send as source address addresses from that VPN gateway not from the BNG or from the cellular network. Okay, so okay let, let's take this. We need yeah. to move on to the to next the, one. Okay. Yeah. Take this on the mailing so, list. Uh, and then we'll do both of you afterwards for, for questions. But Pierre, can you come up and present uh, your version? Okay, so hello everyone. As Beckett said, I'm going to present um, a possible solution to the, to the problem he explained. It's an array-based solution and so next slide, please. Um, I'm going to go fast on the problem because this is part of the overview draft. Uh, basically what happens is, um, well, you know, BCP38, it's ingress filtering. And because of that, uh, SATER appeared. Uh, and SATER is used in multi-home networks. Uh, HomeNet is a very good example of uh, multi-home networks. So this is, this is a limitation, it's, uh, but it's also a feature because right now, when you send a packet in a multi-home network, uh, you, can, you can use the source address to um, decide which uplink interface, which uplink ISP the packet is going to go to. So hosts are going to be connected to this kind of networks. And for that reason, hosts will need to handle uh, SADER as well. They will need to be able to cho choose the, the right next stop router. So last I, uh, last I checked, there were comments that maybe the um, rule 5.5 from default uh, source address selection may handle this problem. 
The issue is that this rule relies on the fact that at the point uh, you decide the next stop, the, the source address, you already know your next stop. The problem is that if you use Sailor, well, the next stop depends on the source address. So it's, it's a looping problem. It doesn't really solve the, the issue. Uh, in the first example, you have a host that is connected to two to different routers on two different interfaces, and the application, not the default, route, the default address selection, just the application is going to pick the source address. And at that point, you can't really apply the default source address uh, selection mechanism. Um, a second case is where, well, you could have a host connected to multiple different routers. Uh, the PIO may not be the sent by the router uh, you want to route packet to. It's a little bit of a corner case, I agree. The last example is more common. It's the, it's the home net case on the bottom right side. Uh, in home net, all the routers are able to uh, synchronize themselves and all the routers will uh, send the same PIOs on the link. And in that case, the, the host, which, which would be connected on, to multiple routers, wouldn't be able to use the PIOs to decide which, the, which is the right next step. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what, what's, what are the consequences to, the, to this problem? So worst case, because of BCP38, the packet would be dropped. No, uh, in home net, for instance, we can handle that. The routers do say the routing, so it's going to be fine. The packet will go out, uh, go out the right exit. Uh, the problem is more inefficiencies, like uh, the packet will be redirected on the same interface twice. Uh, if you don't have redirects, well, it's kind of uh, inefficient, but that's all. If you have redirects going on, you can have very awkward situation, which I called a redirect ping pong. Uh, you, have, you have two flows uh, open to the same destination address, but with different source addresses. Uh, and the, um, these two flows are supposed to go to di through different routers. So if you send the packet right the first time, well, maybe the second flow, you will be wrong because you use the same router, so you, you will get a redirect. And so you will change your destination, your next up router. And for the second flow, it will be okay. But for the first flow, well, it's, it's wrong, so you will, you will get a redirect again. Uh, the basic problem here is that um, redirects are not source specific. So either we change the redirects uh, with source specific stuff, or we decide to make some configuration option in the hosts. Uh, next slide, please. So now let's move to the solution I'm proposing. It's a really simple one. It just relies on one new uh, array option, uh, which simply comes from the RFC 4191 uh, routing information option. Just to be clear, it's not the prefix information option at all. It's routing information option, which is defined here. Um, and so that new option, which I call the Sailor IO, like uh, source, address, source address dependent routing information option, is just exactly the same as the IO, but you include as well um, source prefix. So you have just the source length and the source prefix uh, fields in there. You still have the priorities, you still have the lifetimes, just like in RFC 4191, and the processing is almost exactly the same. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, second point is the routing information option for backward compatibility reasons with those hosts that want to implement the um, Sailor stuff uh, right away. So we just defined one new bit, which is called the ignore bit. Uh, once again, it's in the routing information option, not the PIO. Um, when the I bit is set, well, if you are a Sailor host, well, you will, you will ignore the PIO. And if you know to handle the, the Sailor uh, RIOs, well, and the high bit is set, you will just ignore the, um, the RIO. Um, using this bit, basically, you have independent configuration capabilities of uh, Sailor capable and Sailor not capable hosts. So that's the point, uh, to be still backward compatible if we need to. Next slide, please. Um, now, let's move a little bit into the details of it, uh, about the host requirements. Uh, right now, with RFC 4191, what we have is that host maintain a list of uh, entries. Entries are identified by um, destination prefix, uh, next stop router, the address, and the interface on which the router is. Uh, this proposal just implies that you add one more field in these entries. This field is the source prefix. Uh, it's a, as simple as that on the um, entries point. Um, now, when you receive an array, well, 
if the IBT is set, just like I said, if the, uh, you ignore the, um, the RIO when you receive a RIO, and when you receive a um, RIO with the IBT not set, you will consider it as a say the RIO as well, but with the source prefix being unspecified, like the default source prefix, if you prefer. Uh, then the processing is just exactly the same. You add, you add entries, you update them, you delete them, exactly like you did with RFC 4191. Um, and finally, well, when it comes to send packets, you, do, you just do SADER. So instead of just looking at the destination uh, address and do destination longest match, you will do a destination end source address longest match. And if you have ties, you will use the, the prefix, uh, the, the router preference the, route, the entry preference, to be exact, uh, and at that point, if you still have ties, well, you would you would be able to load balance between the two routers. Uh, next slide, please. Now, on the router side, well, it's a little bit like the um, routing information uh, options again. You just need to be careful because you don't want to send multiple uh, options encoding the same source and destination prefix, just like the RIO. It's a little bit more tricky because now if we are backward compatible, well, you can actually send uh, routing information options with the I bits which is set and say the routing information options uh, encoding the, the same destination and source prefixes. Just that by doing so, you will have some kind of hosts which will just consider the RIO and other kind of hosts which will just consider the SADER RIO. So it's a little bit more tricky, but nothing very complicated. Uh, and again, with that principle, you can configure the hosts uh, that are uh, SADER capable and SADER not capable completely independently uh, for backward compatibility. Next slide, please. So before you, you ask questions, I will answer some of them, the questions I had a lot, uh, well, a lot, based on the few reviews I got before publishing the draft. Uh, why not just using PIOs? Um, the problem, we, first of all, with PIOs, you won't have the router priority, so it will just be a binary information. Uh, so here, in that case, it's, it's PIO because um, in rule 5.5, for instance, uh, it, it assumes that you will send the pack, you will pick the source address uh, such that it's the right source address given the, the router that it, uh, is advertising the PIO. So that's why uh, that question. Um, a second problem of the PIO is that you can't really select the destination uh, uh, prefix. In the routing information option, you have this destination prefix and it's pretty useful. So why not putting that in the SADER option as well and have a SADER option as well with a destination prefix? And finally, the, the, the main argument against using the PIO is the, is the coupling between the configuration and the routing. For instance, if you, if you have a host, again, connected to uh, two different routers, well, be, behind these routers, you have uh, a network where things are going on. And based on what is going on in that network, you may want to change the routing. So you may want the host to, use, to, to, to move from one router to another one. But the PIO is still valid. The, the address would still be valid. So you, you probably don't want to try to move the PIO from one router to another because in that case it could be deprecated and the host would kind of have wrong configuration. And so, so that point is because the routing changes uh, are um, faster and more frequent that con than configuration changes. Um, second possibility would, would be to not use the ignore bits, uh, but use uh, more, a different uh, approach which would consist in always ignore the routing information option. Uh, that would be just less efficient, uh, like you would, need to, uh, you would need to add more TLVs. I think this ignore bit is pretty useful to, to compress the information. And finally, well, um, TLV alignment in the source address dependent routing information object option is a little bit awkward. I completely agree. The problem is that if you want to put two prefixes with variable lengths, well, you will mess up with the alignment. That's, uh, that's for two. Or you will waste bytes. I'm almost done. I just have one more slide. I finish. Uh, thank you. So for, for references, a few other drafts from, uh, from Beckett. Um, I just did a little implementation of Linux uh, yesterday, on Linux yesterday. Uh, it's not tested yet, but basically the, the idea was to uh, see how uh, complex it would be. Just like just 60 more lines of code to, to implement it. It's really simple. Thank you very much. So can we just start with some clarifying questions on, on peers, and then we'll just have a general, general questions on, on the solution. Oh. Uh, so there's a question for uh, Pierre. 
So the alignment, I would really like the field to be aligned. And I have a suggestion for you how to do that, okay? So there's like this, uh, what you have to do is like very simple. So you just need to move all the octets one to the left. So the, the type starts at eight and plus seven. Chris, so this is not a clarifying question. <laughs> okay. Save this for later. Okay, please. so. No, um, we're, we're really out of time. So. Okay, so I think the alignment is easy and you don't have to waste bytes. And I'll send text okay, to the Okay, thank you very much. That's welcome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to clarify or correct uh, in my presentation I called PIO, but it should have been called RIO. I want to clarify that. I think somebody mentioned he was confused. I'm, my apologies for that. So it's just an aiming. The other thing is, your, um, uh, can you go back to that um, uh, option, option picture? Why, the one before, yeah. Why, why destination prefix? I don't understand because in, in, even in RIO it's called prefix or root prefix. Yeah. Why, why I changed the name? Just to be clear, just because I have the source prefix and the you destination. Mean that the host will talk to the router? Huh? It will receive the option by every. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, uh, Dave, please go. So, so we're now doing the general. We're now discussion. in the general discussion line. It's not a clarifying question. Okay. Okay, so um, you can probably sit so down. Th okay. Well, actually, I want to talk to him, so you okay. oh, can stay okay. up there. <laughs> uh, so I'm speaking partly with my hat on as the uh, one of the two authors of RFC 4191, mm -hmm. um, which this is updating. Uh, my opinion is you're doing the right thing. Um, I think the design that you showed here and you know, slide four and slide five is exactly what I was expecting, so thank you, good work. Um, the, I wanted to make a couple comments on uh, suggestions. One is uh, in 4191, it defines three types of hosts, you know, type A, type B, type C. I would recommend that we define a type D, okay, which is the one that is type C plus the, the SATR information too, and that would be a good uh, terminology addition. Yeah. Um, uh, Beckett mentioned that you know Rule 5.5 in the overview document covers many issues. Um, one issue that wasn't in your slides that I think is important to cover is the case where there's one router that's multi-home, then it has two prefixes, meaning it has two RIOs and two PIOs, and part of the problem is how do you match which one goes with which one, and that's why this is the right design, right? Mm -hmm. The diagram that you showed showed two different routers. That's the easier case to solve. The one that you need this design for is the case where there's a single multi-homed router that's giving you two different prefixes, um, and two external prefixes and two routes maybe, okay? Um, and so that's the one that I think this is the right design for. And then finally, my last comment was, um, you talked about one of the issues is if the app picks an address. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to point out that um, besides for 5.5 and the source address selection, there's rule number one in the destination address selection, I believe that we should add specific text about that one. And rule number one says when you're doing destination address selection, you avoid unreachable destinations. Okay? Now, if an application has specified the source address and you have SATR information, then you can immediately rule out some destination as being unusable. Okay? So rule number one can actually, be, can actually make use of the SATR information and constrain that to get the right answer. Okay? And so I think that's logic that should actually put, be put in. So thank you. Those are my suggestions. Thank you. No, it means that if you have a source address, okay, and you have a different destination that has, has, it has to be constrained to a source address that's not the one that you picked, you know that that's an unusable destination because if you're going to send to it, you're just going to get an ICMP unreachable, right? So it's to, the, RA, the RA is telling you that ahead of time, so why bother trying it when it's telling you you're going to get an error, right? I learned the clearly, I, I want to uh, agree with Dave. I think, I think we need this. Uh, and that the, I think this is what it needs to look like. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So the implementation, uh, does it use like, does it do like config IPv6 subtrees or is it sort of? Yes. Okay. It's, it's already there actually. Um, well, I, I, I didn't mention it, but uh, the, the implementation uses a different um, TL, uh, option format because when I was implementing, I figured out that it would be simpler to implement with um, putting all the source prefix at the end. But the, the thing is, you know, in the code you have this RIO only, and at some point the RIO creates a routing entry. Well, the function that creates that entry has just uh, null, uh, comma, zero for the source prefix. Uh, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and instead you fill it in, yep. Okay, um, the only question I have really is uh, sort of 
not a criticism at all. It's the question that as we, because we're, so we're talking about revving the hosts, right? Takes a long time, you know. I guess, should we think about anything else that we might need in the near future in terms of, you know, HomeNet and Seder stuff before we sort of standardize this and go ahead on it? That's sort of my question, right? It, 4991 has this preference, but we, ne we, we never really agreed on what that meant. Um, it's not a metric. It is a metric. It's not a metric. So I, I, I'm just thinking, you know, is there anything that we think we might need in HomeNet that's, you know, six months away as opposed to three years away? And if so, we might want to bake it into here. Otherwise, we should go ahead with this. Uh, Brian Carpenter. Um, I think we need something that does this, but I think precisely because of the question that, uh, that was just asked, that Lorenzo just asked, I think we need the overview document as well because that explains the background and why we're doing something and which cases are being taken care of elsewhere, which cases still need to be taken care of. So I would say regardless of whether we take this solution exactly as proposed or pick its alternative solution, I think we need the overview document. That's why I'm saying we need the overview document so that we do actually have a working group document that lays out what we think the problem area is and which problem cases are already solved or are being solved elsewhere, for example, by MIF, and which problem cases still need to be solved. So, Brian, a question for you. If you see the problem as it has been described uh, in these two presentations, uh, is that a fair statement of the problem or do you think we still have a still missing bit? I, I think it is. I mean, I, I think it's a fair statement and I think the scenario that um, uh, Eric just mentioned is exactly one of the scenarios in, in the overview document. So I think we're probably on the right problem now, but I still think we need the overview document just for future readers. Yeah. Okay. Eric? So, Eric, not Mark. So at a high level, I can sort of understand how this works, but I haven't thought through all the different corner cases with when you end up with multiple interfaces and you have some routes that have source information and you have other routes that don't, right? I think that we tinkered around this a couple of years ago in the Solaris implementation and some of the semantics of doing that with longest match and how is longest match defined can get a bit hairy. And so one thing I wonder whether you've thought about is sort of decoupling this from the Rio itself and saying, Rio gives me some set of routes, and I can get those from multiple routers and multiple interfaces. But then if I, in addition, have some adjunct information that says, that I also get from the routers, but, but that's separate from the routing itself that says, when sending to this destination prefix, prefer using the source prefix. And basically saying it's a separate thing that isn't directly tied with routing. Whether, whether you've considered that and whether it's useful to explore that to see whether things actually get simple, simpler to think through the corner cases. Right? Basically, I route the way I would, I do source address selection, I have this additional input into, into source address selection saying this destination prefix goes with the source prefix. The, the, the problem I see here is that the, um, we, in the HomeNet case, for instance, you will have the application that will really want to pick the source address by itself. and. I mean, if we do is if we do it like this, um, we would need the, the, some API between the, the kernel and the application, such that the, the application is able to to see which source address it it has the right to use for a given destination. But but, whereas if you have routing, well, you just let the application send the packet, and I think it's the right way to send packets. Actually, uh, Lauren told about the, the the host and routing. I think the the hosts are actually doing routing. And having, um, having, I mean, it's a hot topic, I guess, but having a different model for hosts is a little bit broken. And if it's even broken in the impl implementation of Linux, you have Linux doing a, doing a routing lookup to know the next stop, and that lookup is done with an undefined source address. That, that's completely weird. But, but I, thought, I don't understand. So, so we need... Okay. I'd like to sort of try to keep this to the mm. general discussion as to whether we think the working group thinks there's a problem here we should be working on as opposed to 
we're not ready to get into the specifics of this yes, yet. So let's try to finish the mic. Can I put myself in the queue for a comment? Sure. <laughs> okay, uh, Stephen Bart again. Um, I was wondering about the compatibility with uh, the default router lifetime thing. I think you mentioned it in your draft at some point, but I'm not sure um, if we are in a situation where we only want to have source uh, address uh, restricted routes but we still have uh, legacy clients on the same link, so we need to set default router lifetime. I think we need to have some consistent way to disable the uh, route created by the default router lifetime for that. Yeah, I agree. This is, a, this is already included in the routing information option uh, with the host type ABC. That's right, that if we have a type D, uh, we would need to define the way you can um, override or override the default router, but that's already in the routing information option. Let's not go further into the details right mm -hmm. now, I think. Um, sorry. Yeah, I just want to mention that we have to think about it at some point. Yeah. Actually, I th Alex Petrescu, actually, I think most of the things have been said uh, that I also wanted to say now. Uh, the, you, uh, in this draft, you suggest a, a new way of encoding a new value, the source uh, prefix but uh, I don't think we have a, uh, a way of, um, we don't have a specification of how the host acts with uh, source-based routing. You, you gave an example of algorithm mm -hmm. in one of the slides. Do a longest prefix match on destination and then on the source, but this is still high level. We have this default route question that has, has been mentioned with default router lifetime and so on, but uh, in case we have selection based on longest match on prefix and uh, on uh, source and longest match on destination. And, each, and if each one of those has a default escape, which of the default will be used? The default route of the source or of the destination? So I think that's been worked on in the routing area. I, I, don't, I saw Fred Baker earlier. I don't know if he's disappeared. Uh, wow. But there are certainly work on, on the actual algorithm, uh, both in home net, I think, and in, in the routing area of uh, longest destination match versus source. Go, Dave, if you have the answer. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so, so if that, that was one question. The other is if we have CIDR on destination, can we also have CIDR on SADR? How many bits on the source address do we use to search? 64 or more? Okay, well, let's hold that question. Dave? Um, so I think that uh, the discussion of exactly the host behavior for how what you do on receipt of this is something that the document needs to cover. That's something that I think that the working group should agree on. Um, my personal opinion is this document should be adopted and then the working group should work on that. I have opinions on how I think that should work, um, which we don't have to go into all the details right now, but just to um, say a flavor is to say, if the source address prefix is used only for constraining the candidate set, Okay, and everything else works as currently described, that is another possible way that it could work besides the way that you had. That's the style of discussion I think this working group should have, but I don't think that should hold up, say, a call for adoption, for example. Pierre, no, I, I had a question for Beckett, maybe. No, let, time let's for that. not do that now. Okay. Thank you. So I think what we're hearing is that there seems to be interest in working in this space. Um, I think the chairs need to talk to our AD um, and uh, figure out a way forward here. I, I don't think we're quite ready to do a call for adoption on any drafts yet today, but I, I think there's some interest in working get it in this space as opposed to a specific solution. So why don't we go on? Yep. Thank you. Then Stefano, you're up next. Remember to stand in the pink box. It's not very pink. It says pink on it. <laughs> okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Stefano Previti from Cisco. I present here an update on uh, segment routing IPv6. May I ask who read the draft? Okay, quite a few hands. Very good. Uh, those are, this is a partial list of contributors. I have to admit that I just realized that a, a few of them are missing. Sorry for that. Next slide. 
So we have three uh, drafts that are submitted in two different groups, spring for the use cases and six month for the uh, segment routing header and the uh, security of the segment routing header. Uh, Maybe, I, I don't know, this is a discussion that is ongoing with the chairs. Maybe we should find a single home for all those drafts or keep them on different groups. I mean, this is something that needs to be sorted out. But still, the content of those drafts is, is worth, um, worth to read it. Next slide, please. So, uh, very short, I just give an update on the latest version, but the, the idea of segment writing is to uh, define a new uh, writing header type, a new type that looks pretty close to what writing header zero was and where you encode the segments. And a segment is an IPv6 address and uh, you send a packet to that address, the packet is inspected in the segment running header and the next segment is found. So <clears throat> mechanisms that have been already initially defined already in the RFC 2460, I think, and uh, we just kind of update them uh, apply the security that is described on, a, on another draft that Eric is going to present uh, after me. And uh, we use this to uh, steer traffic, so for uh, many different use cases. Next slide. Uh, so a segment obviously can represent a, a routing forwarding instruction, but can also represent other things like a, a, an egress interface on a peering point, like a service uh, instance. So it's not something which is uh, bound to the routing layer. It's, it's just an identifier that represents an instruction. And as long as you propagate the semantic of, of the instruction, you, you can do mostly whatever you like. So initially, the, you, the, the initial set of use cases was somehow inherited from the MPLS data plane where you have traffic engineering, fast reroute, and VPNs and all those services. And you want to have the same kind of uh, services implemented into the v6 data plane without the MPLS stack. Next slide. So this is what the uh, segment routing header looks like today. We made the uh, last change was uh, essentially on the segments left uh, field that wasn't used properly in the initial uh, versions of the segment routing header draft. And thanks to uh, comments that we received, uh, we, uh, we obviously uh, fix that so that we are completely compliant with uh, what segments left, uh, left should be, especially when the packet is brought to its destination and the segments left is zero, so we can happily ignore the, the segment running header rather than inventing uh, procedures to uh, drop it, ignore it, or, or uh, process it. Next. Uh, okay, I think we can skip the slides. It's just a repetition of uh, how uh, the, the, the segment routing uh, works. Now, uh, we have multiple implementations that address different use cases, and we already have done uh, quite a bit of work in uh, demonstrating the interoperability, uh, the different applicability of segment routing, uh, even in, in ATF, I think last ATF and this one. Uh, there are still uh, demo available, available to, to show you those, those different use cases. And uh, based on that, next slide, uh, it, it would be good if we could uh, think about an adoption of this uh, draft as a working group document so to get maybe uh, more feedback from the six-man working group. So we, get, we got some, but we would like to have probably more uh, involvement from this community. On the, on the draft, so uh, maybe the adoption as a working group document. Knowing that we have multiple implementations, now we are at version five, uh, so there is some sort of stability maturity. Uh, so I think the, 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 the requirements to be considered as a working group document are met or very close to be met, and so uh, that's the question we would like to ask. That's it. Any comments? Pierre, are you not? Brian is coming. Yeah, Brian Carpenter. I am still very worried by the concept that this thing sometimes takes it upon itself to insert headers in a packet and route, which is not allowed by any IPv6 specification. I know that if it's 
tunnels, that's okay. But uh, putting stuff into a packet on the way through the network and making the packet longer is just fundamentally against the spirit of IPv6 design. So I know it can be made to work in some local closed domain, but I think it's a very tricky thing to put on the standards track. Eric Nordmark, yeah, so echoing what, what Brian said that. Now, the reason that we, we don't insert IPv6 headers and make the headers bigger is that it messes up path empty discovery. Well, you can argue it's already messed up, but it messes up even more because it won't work at all with the ICP errors coming back in that case. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah. why we've said in, in many different contexts over the years with mobile IP saying, okay, the way you do this stuff is you, you put an extra IP header on the front and that one can have whatever headers you want and then carry the original packet you know, do encapsulation. Yeah, sure. John just Comcast. So um, we, we support the work, obviously, and um, we, I, I don't entirely, I, I, for the record, disagree, I do disagree with, uh, with, with Brian and others. Uh, we really have investigated this area quite a bit and, and really have a number of valid use cases that we feel is going to kind of help you know, us modernize the way that we kind of build our infrastructure for, you know, the future. So um, I agree with Stefano, you know, it would be great to get some more contributions from folks. Um, and this is, this is work that, that, that we intend to, you know, to, to utilize in the, in the not distant future. Um, thanks. Lorenzo Colidi, I don't know that this is, uh, inserting headers is fundamentally opposed to the architecture of IPv6. I, I, it's, it's probably true that, I, I mean, I don't know, it, but it's probably true that uh, currently it's not allowed for uh, intermediate nodes to insert uh, extra headers, but I don't see why we couldn't allow it as long as we did it properly, i.e., you know, we insert it in the right place, we don't stomp on any extra headers that are in the middle. Um, that, that, that seems fine to me. It's, it's kind of like a, a push stack where you basically push headers atop, atop of the extension header chain. As long as you preserve that chain as it is end to end when you exit the cloud, there should be no damage. Um, of course, we have to make sure it's done properly. Regarding MTU issues, that's really a red herring, okay? Like we do this today in IPv4, we have this MPLS cloud, we, imp we impose this extra four byte header. Guess what? Yeah, if your MTU is 1500 and you don't have room to the header, you drop the packet. The way you do it is you make sure that the, that the MTU on the inside the cloud is slightly higher than the MTU outside the cloud. This is a solved problem, right? This is really not hard. Thanks for pointing this out. So, yeah, Eric Normark again. So it works as long as you can actually con con control the environment, right? And, but also Indeed. you need to make sure that your ICMP, there's one other piece, you need to make sure your ICMP errors don't leak out because they'll potentially be confusing. So when, when we do end caps, whether it's, you know, <laughs> there's a design team uh, that's been looking at the stuff that I've been leading, but if, if you can actually do end caps and you know, I provision the, the underlay here. I know I have enough space, whether it's beer or you know, SFC or NBO3 or whatever. Yes, you can, you can operationally do that, but when you do it this way, there is a risk that an ICP error will actually leak out and go back to the host. And yeah, you need I, to block that I, I think we can, I, I fully agree with what Lorenzo said, and I think I really like Lorenzo's approach that says, Rather than starting from saying, oh, it's not allowed, it's written in the law book, let's not do anything. Let's see if we have a use case. Let's see if we can come with a solution that works, that address those issues, that made those RFC to be written in, in, in the way that have been written. So let's, let's try to see if there is a, a practical use case that can still be addressed despite the fact that in theory you're absolutely right we are screwing no, it, ITU. It's more than in theory and if you get an ICPR it will go back to the house. No, no, but I, I agree right. with you. That's, that's, that's true but let's look at the reality. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't explore this stuff, right? I don't think it's because it's in the law book but I, I think it is different than in other cases when you do encapsulation because then you get that error back to the encapsulation, you know, the ingress, right? Absolutely. And it might be no, able no, to absolutely. use this because it can log it to system management saying, sorry, you misconfigured your underlay and your MTU screwed up, right? 
In this case, you don't have that option because if that error is emitted, it's addressed back to the host. And the host might just ignore it, it might do something wrong, but you can't actually use it for anything else either, right? So you need, those issues have to be worked through. I'm not saying it's unworkable, yep. right? Absolutely. Bruno Lucrane, I'm co-chair of uh, Spring. Um, this is something we have in our charter. So we have to work on the use case, we're working on it. And we have to work on um, defining the requirements for IPv6 header. So we, we will need uh, the feedback of six men on, on that work to know if we can do it or not. Uh, but we, we need some, some feedback at the end, whether it's okay or not, or things need to be changed. But we need uh, some, some feedback, some documents to, to say, you cannot change that, uh, there has too much impact, or it's okay, but some point it needs to be discussed in, in six months. Six yeah, there will be a lot of things that have to be discussed. Thank you. Yep. Hi, this is James Woodyard from Nest Labs. Uh, so I'm responding to Brian Carpenter's concern that we don't usually like to insert headers into the chain, and that seems to be an interesting theoretical concern, but isn't it the case that when the, the encapsulation layer happens, that if you were to put an IPv6 header in front of the packet, then put the segment routing header, and then encapsulate the rest of the IPv6 packet after that, that that's really sort of a, something that could be compressed <laughs> because the, the header that you're going to be adding is is really not something that actually has to be sent. It can be inferred from the presence of the segment routing uh, header. And that you could write this spec that says in, in the abstract, there is this abstract IP6 header at the front that's implied by the segment routing header. And then when the decapsulation happens, if there's path MTU discovery packets that are flying around with ICMP6 errors, well, then there is the abstraction of that outer IPv6 header that that has to be pulled off at the at the decapsulation layer that you could explain it all this way, right? You don't actually have to send that that IP6 header. It's it's entailed. It's implied. Sort of like the IP6 header that's that's entailed by the the TCP header when you're calculating the checksum on the TCP. Um, could it be possible to to edit this document so that that it addresses Brian's concern without actually having to put the IP6 header on the wire and decapsulate it. That's fine. <laughs> well, <laughs> well <laughs> yeah, sure, we can change it upside down. But the idea is to really leverage the routing header, I mean the segment routing header, for the purpose that uh, it has been invented for. So uh, I, I'm not sure I got all the details of your, of your point, but just to be sure, I do not I mean, I My point is, is that I like the idea of adding the, the segment routing header and then stripping it back off so that it doesn't actually, inside, so I think in the middle of the network. Suggesting the null end cap compression. It, uh, where it is already uh, documented like this in the sense that at the ingress of the segment routing domain or at the source of the packet, you may insert the segment routing header and give already an instruction on what to do before delivering the packet to a destination. Right, I'm just saying so when, you you that, so when you insert so that second we'll routing header, you are okay, okay, also we're, we're, inserting we're, it. We are at way out of time here, and yeah. we'd like okay. to have the other talks in the queue for later to have time to talk. So, so. so, so let me try to wrap this up. So um, with the reservation now, we have to ensure that we get a good home for this draft, and we agree with the spring chairs and the, in the ADs. Could I get a sense of the room of the interest of, of working on this? This is not an adoption call, just that, you know, do we think that this belongs in this group and that we can actually uh, give some valuable contribution on this? So could we, could we just hum on that now, please, in support? And those who don't think we should ever consider doing routing headers again? Well, that was a bit uh, strong, but, you know. <laughs> uh, those who don't think we should do this. Okay. There's a single single hum there, I think. No, not as many. Okay. All Thank right. you. Thank Cheers. you. Eric?
Okay, so my name is Rick Vink. So next slide it will be a short presentation. So what we did in changing the to revision number two is basically clarification text. For instance, we were not stating that segment routing was within one single domain in most of the use case. It's pretty similar to what Ripple is doing. So it's within one ISP and not over the complete internet in most of the use case. It's important. I shall come back on this RFC 5095. That's the one that deprecated uh, routing at the type zero. Um, also stated it's not enabled by default. I remember that uh, routing at the type zero was to be implemented in each and every IPv6 node and enabled by default. In our case, it's activated on select node within one ISP, which is, of course, changing vastly uh, the security exposure there. Um, what about ICMP generation? A couple of words regarding BCP38, because, of course, as we, the packets does not follow the exact path as indicated by the routing system, BCP38 in some case is violated. But again, it's within one ISP network, so it's up to the ISP to configure its network correctly and provide exception maybe on BCP38. And also we did David <coughs> sorry, from the University of Louvain uh, because he's detecting a little bit more regarding the HMAC stuff. Next slide. So I selected one sentence from this RFC 5095. Remember, routing at the type zero has been deprecated mainly because you could get amplification attack, so packets looping in the network, mostly forever or until limit exceed, as well as a rebound attack or basically a reflection attack. And the author declared that those two and mini amplification was enough to basically deprecate routing type at a zero, but they also ended Basically, a side effect is that it also eliminates bidding, routing at the type zero use cases. And segment routing, if routing type at the zero was still there, segment routing would have used most of the routing type at the zero. So in blue, however, such application may be facilitated by future routing at the specification, which is clearly what segment routing is doing. Next. So <clears throat> the segment routing at the type uh, it's changed little uh, in Stefano's specification, so we need to change and update as well the HMAC coverage, simply to reflect the new header. In short, we are covering in the HMAC every immutable field. So the maximum we can do, and of course we cannot cover fields that are changed on the path. Next. So we basically think that we addressed all the concern of RSC 5095, First and mainly because it's running in most of the use case within one ISP, so they can trust the inserted routing header, can act on it, and can remove if needed before leaving the domain. So it's pretty the ripple um, security aspect here. And if we want to source the source routing header from the host, this is basically where the HMAC triggers really because then the source is sending all these packets with the HMAC. The HMAC authentication code is checked at the ingress of the segment routing header. And then we go basically like before in a single case where everyone trusts everyone. Uh, and the how do we propagate and configure the shared secret use for HMAC? The, the, the ID is silent on this. We simply refer to the previous use case of BGP, shared secret, or about OSPF shared secret. Um, no need to invent a new protocol here. Mostly it will be by static configuration or by something like SDN. And we've got the key ID that allows for key rollover. So I think we are covered there. So next. Um, so basically my request is the same request as Stefano. Uh, I would love to get this being accepted as a green group document, most of being six months here. So, in, in yeah. my view, I think these two documents would go together and have shared faith, if that yeah. Yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I would sense. say so. Philip yeah. Matthews, just one comment. Um, you stress that this is within a single ISP, but I think it's likely, if it is successful, that there'll be ISPs that will want to do it, you know, between themselves. So, 
I think you should expand your statement a little bit. Okay, fair enough. I can extend it, and indeed we can see those kind of use cases coming. But as long as there is a trust relationship between people, that's the same thing. But you're right, yeah. I should clarify it. Thank you. Jean-Michel Combe. Uh, I have two comments. The first one is about uh, the clean uh, bit mm -hmm. uh, to uh, mitigate uh, uh, topology disclosure. But in fact, I think you are only doing half of the job because uh, that only works after the process of the source routing header inside the source uh, routing domain. What happens before? Mm -hmm. If uh, the, uh, the source uh, header uh, is uh, sent to an uh, entity outside the source router, uh, source routing uh, domain. Okay, you're right. I mean, more to clarify the text there. For the rest of the room, the clean bit is within the segment routing header. It's basically where we remove at the end the last one. When you reach segment routing type, um, segment left zero, we remove the segment routing header. Could help for passing to discovery outside of the domain, for instance. And also, as I said, it's removed in the topology disclosure there. Now, of course, if you are sending the segment routing header from the source, from the host, which is outside of the domain, if we note on the path, we'll see it. So maybe there is a need of encryption? Oh. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Okay. My second comment is about uh, um, why an entity requesting a source uh, routing header outside the source routing uh, domain uh, should trust what he will receive. Uh, again, if you are kind of trusting a kind of SDN controller to receive some information, because you have a contract with this, let's say, this ISP yeah, doing segment routing, you trust th it. There is no security uh, trust relationship between the controller and uh, the entity. There should be one, because if you are a controller from a host, you should trust each other for many other reasons. Yeah, but there is nothing inside the document. Of this. course. Yeah, that's, that's what I say, it's also the school. And thank you. General Google, just coming back to the question of topology disclosure. So if your router has to send ICMP back, it will include the whole packet, including header, which would actually disclose the topology, right? Yeah. So and do anyway, you think it's a threat or do you think that's okay? I mean, because this packet might go outside of the administrative domain. Yeah. So it's really up to you. You can first prevent gen uh, ICMP generation, which would be kind of stupid. But, you know, if you're doing trace route, you will see the path anyway. Yeah, but if I do trace route, I assume I do not see, or I mean, in this case, I will see actually all this uh, routing header installed. So I, I'm just curious, shall you just mention it in the document and say it might be undesirable that uh, host outside of your administrative domain will see all those uh, extension header you installed. And what about like replay attack if I take this header and put it in my p uh, packet and send it to your network? So we need to wrap this up with very yeah. briefly. The yeah. two last it is, we should mention it. And Stefano? Yeah. No, I, I think you, you have a very valid point and I think the question is, is more generic. Is if we, if we adopt, I mean, if we have segment routing headers in packets, should we have a closer look at some tools that we use every day, like trace route, and see what needs to be changed or uh, adapted in those tools, so to reflect what we want to be reflected? It's the same path we took for MPLS. When MPLS has been deployed, we suddenly discovered, oh, TTL propagation, trace route, I want to hide my topology, I don't want to hide my topology, and so on. So I think the same will have to be done for the segment routing header. And I, I mean, that's what I believe. It's the point. Just coming back uh, quickly on my second comment. What happens if you have a um, um, key, a pressure key? Uh, OK, I, I will send uh, an email. Can okay. you guys meet up for beers like this yes. week? And, and yeah, I like beers, okay. you know, right? So yeah. Suresh, please. Thank you, Eric. And where are the blue sheets, by the way? Any blue sheets? Oh, come and get those. 
Hi, uh, my name is Suresh Krishnan. So uh, this draft is not uh, targeted towards the six-man working group. This is some work that's getting done in MIF. But since it's uh, creating a neighbor discovery option, we wanted to uh, bring it to six-man for review pretty much. Okay. So how many people know about the multiple provisioning domain work? Okay. So uh, for people who don't know about this, uh, this is the idea that uh, you could get conflicting information from different sources on a given network. So it could be you could be attached to multiple uplink networks, or it could be attached to multiple routers, or you could have a VPN where you could get potentially conflicting information from different sources. The idea is how do we actually separate the information that comes in uh, from different sources, and how do we group them together? Okay, so that's a very very Poor summary. There's a draft you can read, which gives you like a much better overview of this problem. But um, I don't have much time. Okay, so uh, so this option is um, container option, which we haven't done before in V6. So this is an option that contains other options, and we've done this in DHCP V6, but we've never done this in ND. Okay, so that's why I think it's really good if people here can take a look at it. Okay. So the uh, option pretty much wraps existing ND options. Okay, so um, I I'll show you the format on the next slide. But one of the goals that we did was like if a host is a legacy host that doesn't understand the concept of provisioning domains, it's going to skip all these options. So this is something we thought about quite a bit. So. And there are two options in front of us. One of them is like if the host doesn't understand provisioning domains, should it just process the inner options as if like they didn't come from a provisioning domain? And it kind of made sense in, in some way. But it didn't make sense in other ways. Because if you have the same information coming from different sources, and if you don't have provisioning domain information, you're going to have conflicting information. So we decided to just group all these together and make it atomic. So either you understand provisioning domains or you don't get any configuration information. And uh, I'll show you an example of uh, RA that contains this, uh, which has duplicate kind of information. So one with provisioning domains and one without provisioning domains so that legacy hosts can also get config information. Okay? And uh, uh, we, Again, made an efficiency decision. We said, like, uh, RA can have information from multiple provisioning domains. So it, you, let's say you go to a Starbucks, you could get information both from the Starbucks and from your corporate VPN if they have an agreement with uh, Starbucks. Okay. So uh, this is how the option looks like. Uh, we can take detailed questions over email or offline. But uh, the idea is uh, there's like a key hash which kind of authenticates um, the information that's sitting in there. So it's possible that the information in the container is authenticated by the source. So it's possible that your company could sign something that could be sent by somebody else. But you can still have an assurance that it's coming from the source that it's being claimed here. Okay. And uh, next slide. And we have something called a um, PVD identifier, which says like who's actually providing this information. And uh, this is kind of a blob. The, the, the content of that identity is getting described by a different draft. And the reason we did that is like we want the same kind of identity to come through DHCP and RAs. So people don't get confused about the same information coming in from different uh, configuration protocols. Okay? And as of now, like we have a, a few options in there. Like it could be like a NAI, it could be like a UUID, it could be like a ULA prefix. A bunch of stuff in there in the ID draft. Again, referenced here. Please read it. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, I have no pretense that you're going to be able to read this, but I put it in the slide so Let's you see. you can see if the format of the packet, like in case you wanted to see it. Okay. But so as I said, I'm not going to describe it. So next slide. OK, so um, we just wanted to have uh, opinions from the working group on what you think of this uh, container option format, since it's been not been done before. And any other comments on the draft? Dave. Uh, Dave Taylor, I have a comment that's not limited to this draft, but it actually applies uh, the relationship between this draft and another draft. So I've been a member and participating in the MIF design team and work, so I'm a fan of this approach. So, um, but uh, something that I think that this working group should think about is if you go back to this, the, the point that said, um, you know, legacy hosts will ignore the container option, right? 
So that means for a legacy host, you need to include it sort of both ways, both the legacy host, right. And so what this means, the, the, the analogy is when we go back to Pierre's presentation, which talked about this type D SATR information, you need to send stuff one way for the legacy hosts and, one, and a different way for the new hosts. And so the question that this working group should think about is how many different options are there and how big does the RA get? Or can you force some dependency that says, well, we don't care about either hosts that support SATR but not uh, multiple, prefix, uh, multiple provisioning domains or vice versa or something. Can we narrow the different permutations so that we don't have to, so we can have a linear thing of type A, B, C, D, E and not some arbitrary permutation that blows up the RA size? Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, Richard, Sir, Richard Sir, Kaya. Uh, I like this container option. Uh, I think my, from my point of view is uh, we are trying to define all these other uh, next hub and all those options which are kind of this uh, PVD. And so that, you know, people are concerned, oh, we are defining too many array options. No, we are not defining too many array options. We will put everything into this container option. Right. What do you think? Um, so the one thing I can say is like whatever goes in here, it needs to come from the option space. So you're still going to define multiple options, except that they don't show up in the packet as an option. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Stephen Bart again. Um, one thing regarding uh, MTU issues, maybe, if you start adding all this uh, signature stuff in now in the RAs and other people want to throw other stuff in the RAs, I think we might run into some issues here at some point and in general should think about a kind of strategy here and how we deal with this? Okay, uh, so just to respond to you, uh, the way the draft is written, it says that you don't have to uh, club stuff from multiple provisioning domains into one RA. So you could send multiple RAs with information about multiple provisioning domains. So that's how we take care of m not making the packet too big, right? So there's no requirement to bunch all this together, but we have that option to bunch it together to for efficiency purposes. Okay, so we still can do different PVDs in different RAs. Yeah, sure, but I mean, uh, even if we have only one, at some point a general issue will arise if we just stick more stuff in it and then some other mechanism will add signatures for something else and, you know, how it will end up like and if you have like this 1,280 bytes as like baseline, we will be there at some point. All right, thanks. Not at thanks. Christian? I read your security question written by Microsoft. I read your security consideration, but there's something missing in your draft, which is a privacy analysis. Okay, thanks. Because uh, you, you are going to add in, in those packets uh, a bunch of identifiers, like your, your domain and things like that. And there's an obvious privacy issue that happens if a host goes to another domain and discloses this kind of information. So that, that really should be part of the privacy. I mean, you really need to have that in your, in your discussion. Right. And, and one specific place where we see this is like um, this option, right, for the PVD ID yeah. can also go into an RS. So a host can actually put in information that it wants, and there it becomes even more problematic. I agree. Exactly. So you, you really need to, to discuss that as a privacy consideration, explain the mitigation and things like that. Right. And I think it's like a trade-off between privacy and efficiency, and I think we should document that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Do you want okay. to have a discussion both, on both lists? or do you prefer Either list or to authors, like whatever, but we would like to hear comments. So okay. we really got some okay. good so comments. Take Thank this you. on the mailing list. Thanks. Uh, then we're on for our lightning talk sessions. We keep questions and comments to minimum. And Fernando, you are first. Well, we're, so we're over, already over book. So let's just do the presentations and have questions and comments on the mailing list. Should I use this one? Yes. Yes. Go. Um, I'm Fernando Gott. I will be presenting the document current issues with DNS configuration options for Slack. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we have two different uh, neighbor discovery options. Um, for DNS rela related information, one is RDNSS, which is for recursive DNS uh, servers. The other one is DNS uh, SL for the DNS search list. And both of these options have lifetime value that specifies for how long this information is, is valid. And this is the current uh, lifetime value that is, in, that is in the specs. Okay, next slide. So what's the problem with this value is that it has been found to be too short. Um, so the problem is that uh, in some network scenarios, uh, the uh, root advertisement messages are dropped. 
and then this means that essentially the DNS information times out. Uh, now this problem is exacerbated because uh, there are some implementations that, uh, f first of all, they consider this to be a hard failure, and then they also tie the V6 connectivity with the V4 connectivity and means that they bring the link completely down. So if you find this problem on V6, then it also affects the V4 the connectivity. Uh, what this document does? Well, first of all, the first, the initial version of this document was published, I think, something like three years ago. Uh, we presented it at the time. Uh, the, the, the problem had been um, submitted by uh, the Linux folks uh, working and fixing this problem. That's why we published this document at this time. And we were working uh, nowadays on the ND validation, uh, options validation. Then this issue came up again regarding what we do with DNS, uh, with the DNS uh, related options. So essentially, we were facing this problem again. Uh, we had to validate the lifetime values, but then we know, we already know that in many cases, the lifetime values that the, that, that the specifications require are, are too small. Uh, this document discusses the problem. Uh, it essentially uh, suggests or tries to change the default lifetime value. Change the semantics of the lifetime value, essentially saying that, well, if the only information that you have has expired, well, you can still keep it if you don't have anything newer than that. Um, uh, it also, it's not mentioned here, but it also tries to sanitize the received lifetime value. That's what uh, Linux Network Manager does. I sent a, a couple of pointers to the mailing list with the commit that they did. So that's a, cl a client side modification. Even if the routers are sending you know, these options with very small lifetimes, uh, they actually sanitize the value so that you know, the DNS information doesn't time out. Uh, and it also knows that, and it's, it's, this is not something you know, proposed in this document, but it's actually in the, in the DNS uh, options uh, RFC, that uh, if you want, you can, you know, send the, uh, uh, you can use uh, router solicitations to actually prove and prevent this information from uh, being uh, discarded. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And it's still you. Yeah? It's still yes. you. <laughs> uh, the other document is about transmission and processing of IPv6 options. Uh, if you were, uh, uh, like, the, probably the fastest overview of this document is that this is RFC 7045, 70, but for IPv6 options. Okay, next slide. Uh, so a number of middle boxes actually, uh, you know, even in cases where they shouldn't, they end up filtering packets based on the contents of uh, IPv6 extension headers. This is known, uh, whether we like it or not. And there's also the case that besides what middle boxes do, uh, different um, V6 options are meant for different kinds of, you know, uh, IPv6 headers. And in, in some cases, it's not straightforward, you know, which options are valid for which V6 extension headers. Um, what this document does is essentially uh, do exactly what RFC uh, 7045 did for extension headers, but for IPv6 options. Uh, as far as I know, but Brian will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, IPv6 options were out of the scope of, um, of uh, RFC 7045, that's correct? Uh, so we are trying to complement RFC 7045 with this document. Uh, next slide. Um, so this document clarifies the default, the default processing for IPv6 options. It borrows lots and lots and lots of text and ideas for uh, RFC, uh, from RFC 7045. Uh, uh, that's why I say that it's RFC 7045 for V6 options. Uh, and other than you know, specifying the default uh, processing for this option, it also specifies validation, like you know, if there's an option that it has only be, it's only valid for a specific V6 uh, uh, header, it makes, you know, it makes that clear so that, you know, uh, that can be used as a basis, for example, in host implementations to validate the received messages. Uh, next slide. So this document has been uh, around for a while. We have received a few comments, but uh, I guess that at this point we'd like to know whether you know the working group considers that this is worth pursuing. So let's not now take that on the, on the mailing list. Okay. We want to see some more discussion on the mailing okay. list. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, I come forward. Okay, uh, my name is Ming Zheng uh, from Cisco. 
Uh, today I come to present the uh, draft. It's about uh, improving uh, scalability of switching system in large data center. Uh, in the large data center, have been long issue that uh, because the uh, data center is growing bigger and bigger, uh, and data set server uh, uses virtual machines, so the virtual machine number goes beyond millions. How efficient to support millions of uh, virtual machines in a data center become very challenging to the equipment provider. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, for the ASIC producer, they think uh, too expensive to bake a big table. Uh, you don't want to put a few million uh, fake entries into the ASIC, that be too expensive. So normally uh, they use a small size, smaller size, uh, like a, a Broadcom-based uh, uh, transfer ASIC. They only support 128 uh, V6 uh, rod. Uh, then what to do? Uh, if a customer wants uh, 2 million uh, VMs, so what they do, they break up into the multiple clusters. So each cluster support 128K host. Then with multi-cluster, uh, multi-cluster, you can support up to two, two mean. But the issue is uh, uh, in this scenario, you need uh, uh, many more uh, uh, span, uh, uh, span switch. Also, you need to uh, make communica communication between the span switches. Sometimes you need to base around the top of the top layer of the switches. So this obviously is not that efficient. Another way to do, uh, some people uh, increase the hip size on the spine switches. Uh, so they say, I put a one million VP holes rod on the spine and keep the leaf switches smaller as before. In this case, you don't need uh, many clusters uh, but, however, the, the total cost is still higher because the, on the spine, spine switch, you still need a big uh, ASIC uh, to, to run it. And also, it's hard to manage and troubleshoot. The reason is, on the spine, you have a, a fake table. When, when it becomes full, you, pump, you send the packets to the spine, then let spine to rot it. So the two states of rotting, and when you have a problem, it's hard to find where the, the problem go, you know, exists. Two minutes. Sorry. Okay. Nice slide. Okay. Then we uh, come up with a new proposal. This proposal uh, is very simple uh, way to do. Uh, what we do is uh, we uh, reserve a few bits from the IPv6 address from the IFID portion of address, then build up a kind of hierarchy. So the address assignment to follow this uh, rule, some kind of rule. Then the, the host address was configured by the IGCP server. By doing this, we have uh, uh, two uh, enhancements. First, uh, when we do the route, forward the package between the uh, access switch, we use the so-called uh, AST prefix. That's a prefix includes the switch ID, but uh, set, re reset the uh, subnet ID. So in this layout, we can reduce the number of the uh, LP and table to the minimum. You only need one uh, prefix in that table per word per lead. So that number, total number will be decreased significantly. Also, we uh, introduced another technology called distribute neighbor discovery. Uh, the neighbor discovery only take care of the local host. And for the remote host, we do the proxy on the local uh, lead. Then when the pick, uh, data pick package come in, it will be forward to the remote uh, lead on the remote leaf, it pumps pump to the CPU. Then from there, it triggers the neighbor discovery. 
Uh, th there one was a left. timer going off. Uh, okay, that's a quick summary. So what's good about this? It's it can scale to multiple million holes in single BC cluster with a low cost ASIC. And it has better scalability in hardware because you use small deep, uh, big table size in all the switches. Also have better scalability in software. We use distribute uh, neighbor discovery and no multicast and the message sending between the S switch and no host loss advertisement. So it's easy to manage and easy to troubleshoot. So. Okay, so let's continue that on the mailing list and, and please bring up the discussion there. Okay. Um, Shane? Yeah, oh, I'm here. Um, I will be quick. Uh, so that's IPv6 for label reflection. Next page. Um, the idea is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Copy the value of uh, flow label from uh, IPv6 upstream uh, flow into a corresponding downstream flow. Uh, it helps to correlate the upstream and downstream um, package why, you know, destination address uh, and source address also flow label. Otherwise, you have to go with the five type of, uh, you know, um, including the port numbers that will have to go into the transport layer uh, headers. Um, this is already supported in Linux stable version. Um, with a flag, so the Linux-based uh, end host or network devices could easily use it, uh, you know, to accomplish the full labor reflection uh, mechanisms. Next page. Um, Next page. Sorry. Oops. So you push one more. It's a bit. Oops. Oops. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, we already have some uh, concrete application. Uh, applic uh, applicable uh, scenarios, so the flow label reflection can be done on the application or content to provide the ser server, also the uh, flow uh, on the tunnel end, um, and maybe done by the uh, network edge devices, so that will serve for the uh, same domain. Uh, next page. Yeah, uh, we know the IPv6 flow label is untrusted. Uh, it may be forked uh, by, you know, or it may also um, accept by, uh, you know, the main middle attack. But uh, this do document currently is only many consider the single um, ad uh, administrative domain uh, scenarios only. So in such domain, the flow label should be, you know, um, secure enough to be used for the uh, reflection me uh, mechanisms. So that's my presentation, and uh, I would like to you know, have more discussion in the mailing list. Thank you. Okay. So we are done actually, I think, a minute and a half ahead of schedule. So um, please enjoy your lunch and see you all in, was it Prague? Prague is the next one. So thank you very much. Enjoy your time in Dallas. <laughs>